I know that you all are approaching this day where you are giving thanks for your new, your new rector, Steve Pessa, and his wife with great relief. It's kind of like, why not? And when you go through a time of uncertainty and a time of, we don't know whether this is actually going to work out or not, uh, it wears on you, doesn't it? It grates on you. It, it can make the tasks of the church a little bit more difficult because emotions are tense. Amen. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> I've been through times like that, too. And, and so it's hard as a result of what? To go through that, and particularly for this length of time, to, in essence, sort of relax. It's like the other shoes dropped. It's okay. We, we don't have to keep our emotional guards up. We can find a way to work this out together and actually discover, as a result, the new things that God will do here uh, in a really a new beginning, both for you as well as for the peasants. Uh, because everything about this place at one level or another is going to shift and grow and move into things that, gosh, what's the wonderful verses? I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. And it is exactly in that time when there's a new word of relief coming just by virtue of the peasants being here that I think the scriptures are really very, very important because the whole focus is meant to bring assurance. That's the truth of every single one of those lessons. In the Acts lesson, what are we going to do? Judas has betrayed us. Jesus is gone because he's ascended into heaven. And so what do we do now? And yet, God gives grace to the leadership who are there to say, Lord, what would you have us do? You see, that's the step of faith. The act of um, anxiety is, what are we going to do about that? Yeah. It's the step of faith to say, Lord, what would you have us do? Do, do you hear the difference? You see, the, the first says, if we don't take care of ourselves, you know, we're, we're, we're just going to fall apart. The second is, this is God's church. And therefore, we trust him. He's Lord. We're coming under his authority. And therefore, we know that you have a provision for us. What is it? And out of that, Matthias emerges. An extraordinary saint of God, in fact. Someone who in God used to make a difference. So in some ways, that's the step of faith for you all. It's like, okay, God has now given us the passes. So what would you have us do together? What are you calling us to? And trusting the fact that what is going to happen is that something new is, in fact, going to emerge. Your job is not to preserve what's already here. Because that puts you in a terribly difficult place. That means if that's your position, you will fight against every innovation because you will see that it is somehow a violation of what you are determined to preserve. It's a tough spot to be in. I wouldn't want that for any of you. Instead, God, what are you asking of us? What are you calling us to do together? Because and this was a conversation actually I just had with the pests in the vestry. Everyone here is going to be shaped in some way in the midst of this new adventure. And it's going to be good. Can, do you believe that, that it's actually going to be good? Yeah. You see, if you're in a position of feeling like you've got to preserve something, then what you're saying by that is it's not going to be good. So I've got to make sure that we're going to hold on to what we already have. That, that's actually a position based on fear, not trust. Trust says, we'll see what God does with this. Let's do this together and discover it what that actually might look like together. When you shift over to the epistle lesson in 1 John, John also is writing to a group of people who need reassurance. 
Only the reassurance for them has everything to do with the very basics of the Christian faith. What do we believe in? What do we not believe in? Is it really true? And so we're kind of coming into the middle of something. The language sounds odd because it uses particularly the word testimony in a way that we don't often use it. But what he's trying to say is this. He's been laying out the fact that Jesus is, in fact, who he says he is. He is God in the flesh, and therefore he is worth believing. And what he does is that he presents a contrast. He said, look, if you have somebody you trust, then you believe what they say because you know they're trustable. They are, to use John's language, their testimony. And so the, the, where we pick up, John is writing to them and said, look, you believe in what your people you trust tell you. You believe in their testimony. So why wouldn't you believe in God's testimony, meaning what he has demonstrated in Jesus? Because John is utterly convinced as an eyewitness that what we see in Jesus literally is, like, just like what we say in the creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. The word made flesh, God in the flesh, not just some great teacher, but literally God's unique revelation of himself and what he has said and what he has done is entirely trustable. And that in fact, in trusting in who he is, what God says about him, that's what brings us life. When we give ourselves unreservedly to this Jesus, who God has sent as his only son, the end result of what happens to us is that we come alive in whole new ways. And he says, this is what brings joy. Because I know that I have given myself entirely to one who is completely trustable. He's not just some, here's my new idea. He is who God has revealed him to be which is the very Son of God, who died on the cross, who rose again from the dead, who conquered death, who forgives all of what I have been and brings me to himself. That's the essence of what John is writing in that epistle. And therefore, he is trustable. Therefore, we believe because he is trustable. And because of that, we know that in taking those steps, what's re being released in us is life. He who has the Son has life. Isn't that so much better than he who has the Son feels better about himself? You see, that's, that's really the world's counsel. The world's counsel says you make these decisions, and in the end, you'll feel better about yourself. And that's about the best they can offer. What John is saying is something very, very different and far more profound and important. That to step into the life of God's Son, to say yes to Him, to yield to Him, is in fact being invited into a whole new way of life. Not just a way of life, but it literally receiving into our bodies, into our souls, into the depths of who we are, life itself in a whole new way. It's the echo of what Jesus says when He says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly, to the full. I write these things to you, it says in the epistle, that your joy might be complete. That's the effect of what it means to belong to Jesus. <laughs> I know I'm kept. He belong, I belong to him. He will never let me go. And so that no matter what I encounter in the midst of life, both good and bad, I know that I'm kept in his presence, and that in the end, he will receive me into heaven, and he will never let me go. That is the source of joy. That is what real life is. So today, as people are being confirmed and received, we're going to make some commitments together, renewing, in essence, the commitments that we have made. And I want to say to you, don't make it just a ceremony. Make it that point where you say, in a fresh way, this morning, in this new beginning, we here, the congregation of Holy Child, visitors, all of us gathered together, we're taking a new step in saying yes to Jesus. To Jesus, the one who loves us, the one whom we can trust, the one that brings us life. Because he is, in fact, the Lord of this church. Steve's not, the vestry's not, 
The people who've been here the longest aren't. Who's Lord of this church is Jesus. And we're here together to say yes to him and look forward to the new beginning that God has in this place for this group of people. The new step in the adventure. Let's go back to the beginning. That's not easy to do. If you've been holding on, making sure the building doesn't fall in, making sure the things that have been preserved needed to be preserved, making sure that the people stay here and not fall away to some other place, it's, it's really hard to let go. That's not easy. That's going to take an emotional transition. Isn't that right? Not your head. It is. But what I want to invite you to do is to say, okay, today is the start. I'm willing by God's mercy to begin to release my grip and see what God might do for his plan and for his purposes. Because why? I, I trust him. I trust him. He's the head of this church, and he's the one that's promised to give us life. And on that, anything else, anything less is not trustable. But on that, I will trust. And let's see what God will do together. Let us pray. Gracious, gracious Lord. Thank you that there is always room in us for fresh beginnings. Because that's what it means to be in your life. To know life. To know new life. And to be a part of the adventure of what you were doing. So this morning... As we again say yes to you, we pray that you would open our hearts to that new life. That you would bring for us mercy and forgiveness and healing and real joy. Put a shield of grace and mercy and protection around this congregation. May your Holy Spirit come and release life here. that this might be a place where your children gather and know your joy as we worship together the very King of Kings and the Lord of all lords. Thank you. Thank you that you are trustful and we place ourselves again into your hands. Do what you desire here. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen.